My name is Douglas C. Welch. I am a computer consultant, a new media consultant, a pioneer podcaster. I started podcasting about one week after the term was coined back in 2004. The fact is I had some content. I was already contemplating putting up an audio format, and when podcasting came along, it just sort of jumped out at me. I'm also the founder of NewMediaInterchange.com. This is a free group uh, founded about ooh, five months ago. Uh, which is designed to bring new media to everyone, not just the techies, not just the e-learning professionals, not just people who you would typically think about new media, but everyone, the salon owners, the restaurateurs, the realtors, everybody. And that's sort of what this session is about today. Many to many media in the new learning ecosystem, well, the truth is, and you guys have already figured this out, learning is everywhere. Learning takes place no matter where people are, no matter what's going on. It's all about the learning. Everything I've done in my career has been, it take, it's taken me a while to figure this out, but it's been based around education. New media is just simply one way that I use to communicate and educate everyone else. If you have any questions, throw up your hand. I'll answer anything and everything except perhaps my age, but you can probably figure that out. <laughs> For a hundred years now, we have lived in a one-to-many media world. We had newspapers, we had radio stations, we had television stations. There's an old adage that says, the power of the press belongs to those who can afford to own one. <coughs> the world has really changed, as you've probably seen over the last, let's say, 10 years or so. You don't need a television license. You don't need a radio license. You don't need a radio station or a television station. You don't need any of what we have come to think of as traditional parts to get your message out to the world. We're back in a day where we kind of return to the era of many to many, where we're all sitting around in a cafe that is the size of the world talking to each other. The fact is that the students in your taking your training could just as easily be out there creating their own content as well as consuming yours. And the fact is, I think that is a wonderful thing. Because for the first time ever in the history of what we consider modern media, papers, radio, television, you don't need anyone's permission to do something. You could have written a script, you could have written a novel, you could have uh, written a poem, you could have written a piece of music, but if you couldn't sell it in the past, if you couldn't sell it to one of the big traditional, you know, approved gatekeepers, radio, television, recording industry, whatever, what happened to it? Your friends may have heard it. Your family may have heard it. <coughs> Typically, the book ended up in a drawer, never to be seen again, except by your children or your grandchildren three generations later. Well, what's this, Grandma? It doesn't have to happen anymore. We have the ability to reach out directly to our audience. And we'll talk a little bit about who that audience is in a little bit. One of the great things about new media, think about as you're walking around here today, as you're walking around back home, as you're walking around on campus, as you're walking through your town, what do you see? You see everybody sitting there with the earbuds in. You are literally, when you create new media, whispering in their ears. I came across this phrase when I started talking about new media. It just struck me one day as I was sitting there listening to podcasts on my own. This person is literally whispering in my ears. Text is intimate. We can all cry at the end of Harry Potter, right? Okay? It can move us. We can cry at the end of War and Peace, to use a more classical example. Audio is an exponential level more intimate than text hence the whispering in their ears. And video is even another exponential level higher in intimacy. The important reason for that is we take the audio, we take the human voice, which is very expressive, but then we add in our facial expressions, we add in our gestures, and all of a sudden the amount of information we're conveying jumps a million fold. It's not about being pretty. It's not about, this isn't about traditional media. This isn't about television and the newscaster. Hi, I'm Douglas E. Welch, reporting live. No one cares what I look like. I, you know, I've been described as having a face for radio, which you may have heard. The fact is it doesn't matter. What matters is what my face is saying, what my hands are saying. And you should be thinking in exactly the same way. 
It doesn't matter what you look like. It's the content you have. It's the emotion you have. It's the passion you have about what you're doing that is really important. In talking about new media, and we're going to get into several areas of it here, there is a foundation that underlies new media. And it's a foundation that a lot of you are probably already using. Anybody have an idea what the foundation under new media might be? Internet, web. What's on one level higher than just the web by itself? Blogging. Blogging and blogs are the foundation on which all of new media rests. And there are several reasons for that. One, you have a textual interface, and you can easily enter data on a whim. We don't have to pull up the web page in Dreamweaver, edit the web page, save it out as a new name, FTP it up to the website. We can go to an interface like blogger.com, or if you're using wordpress.com, two of the more common blogging engines out there. We can go to that interface, type it in, copy or paste in, add a picture, hit publish, and it's on the web immediately. We didn't have to go through all that traditional frou-frou that we used to have to go through. I've been doing the web since it was invented, and frankly, I am so happy for blogging. It has made my life so simple, because now I don't even need one of these anymore. If you look on my iPhone, there's a WordPress app. There's a link to blogger.com. I have links to Flickr. Anyone, ever from, anyone familiar with Flickr? What can you do with Flickr once you upload a photo to Flickr? Hit the blog button. Send it to whatever blogs you want. It's amazing how easy it's gotten. But the fact is, blogging is what all this stuff rests on. Because what it provides you, it also provides you a release mechanism for your media. As you might already know, some of you might already know, what do you do if you want to release an audio podcast? You put it in your blog. If you link to a media file in your blog, in most cases, it automatically gets scooped up, put in your feed, that thing that people subscribe to for your blog, and if they're using iTunes or something similar, the media just appears on your audience's computer. And if they're using an iPod, not required, if they're using an iPod, it shows up right here. You have developed an end-to-end -end multimedia broadcasting system using, in most cases, free tools. And you'll learn as I go through my talk today that free is my favorite word. <laughs> easy, probably followed immediately by easy, of which both of these are. So free and easy, blogging. Any questions about blogging? I'm going to just touch on that very lightly today. Okay? I figure most of you are probably familiar with that. There are four pillars to new media today. And I'll joke with you. You can see the fifth one kind of peeking around the corner there. That's because these four pillars every day are bifurcating and splitting. And what was a small piece over here is now becoming its own sort of leg, its own sort of column in the new media world. But as of today, and this could be amended by the time I give this presentation on Saturday, there are four that I really focus on. OK? Anyone from Missouri? Anyone recognize that picture? Univers Mizzou and Columbia? Yep. <laughs> we were there uh, two summers ago at a film workshop, my wife and I. First pillar, if you will, video sharing sites. YouTube, Vimeo, Vidler, there's too many of them to count these days. Uh, what I'm trying to think, Blip TV. Anybody else got another one they like to use? Video sharing sites out there. This, after blogging, has expanded everyone's ability to communicate with the world. It is amazing these days. Uh, I live with a television writer, who a traditional television writer. She is utterly appalled and amazed, equally amounts, to find us sitting around some nights playing Top the Video with YouTube. Oh, I gotta show you this video. And after that video, oh no, no, I got a much better video. An hour will go by. And what have we done? It's even sharing videos in person with each other will take that same effect and multiply it over the entire world of people sitting in their offices by themselves playing Top the Video. And in a lot of cases, creating their own. You, if you were here a little bit early, you saw me playing some of my content. That's what you're seeing in my YouTube collection right now, is all the content that I'm putting out via YouTube. If you have a message to get out to the world, whether it's outward facing or inward facing, you need to be using some sort of video sharing site. There is actually technology to do an internal YouTube. Okay? You can actually do this internally to your company if you wish, 
or you can just as easily use YouTube itself as your marketing tool. If you create a video about your product, about your message, I, I deal with a lot of charities too, and so I often use those terms. Their product, a charity's product, is their message. What are we trying to do as a charity? Where you might have a, oh, let me see if I can think of something really esoteric, a missile guidance system. <laughs> they have a message that you're trying to get out to people. Donate to us because we are doing good things in the world. You should think about that the same way. What would you like to tell someone out there in the world about your company? Okay, what would you like them to know? <clears throat> Sounds like marketing, right? Well, it is, but it's also education. It's also e-learning. You're using the technology that we have for free, favorite word again, for free <laughs> to get your message out. Okay, that's pillar number one, video sharing sites. And there are a lot of them out there. There are some great tools that allow you to distribute your videos out to 12, 13, 14, 15 different video sharing sites with one upload. My favorite one is called Tube Mogul, T-U-B-E-M-O-G-U-L.com. Now initially you have to go and set an account up on all the different sites that it supports. You have to have your account. Then though, you simply take those username and passwords, drop them in to Tube Mogul, you upload to Tube Mogul your video once, you describe it once, you title it once, you categorize it once, you tag it once. Everyone familiar with tags and tagging? You tag it once. It uploads to TubeMogul. You then go, here's all the sites we submit to. Yeah, some might not be appropriate, so you kind of launch. And then you walk away. And about an hour, a day later, your single video is on all those websites ready to be shared with the users on each of those sites. Because the fact is, today, we all live and breathe on different sites. Some of us might be Facebook people, some of us might be YouTube people, some of us might be Blip people. The point is, your video doesn't care. You want to spread your message, and that's one way, using video sharing sites, that you can easily spread your message to the world. Okay? Next pillar, podcasting. Who is that funny looking guy? Podcasting. As I said, I've been podcasting basically since the term was coined. Podcasting offers a couple of advantages over video streaming and sharing sites. Because a lot of people often get confused. Well, isn't putting something on YouTube the same as sending out a podcast? And the fact is, no, it's not. And there are two very good reasons why they're different. One, with a podcast, when you go to a video streaming site and you play, what do you often run into as you're watching the video? La, 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 la. La 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 la, uh, right, it's herky jerky. The quality isn't that good as well because it's been compressed and it's being streamed. The video is literally being sent down the pipe to you live, frame by frame. So if there's any, any breakage or any slowdown in your internet connection, it freezes for, until it catches up, right? And this happens even on some of the fastest internet connections simply because YouTube's too busy, your neighborhood's too busy, your computer, you saw me, my, I got some herky-jerkiness when I was showing the videos here. It just happens. Well, guess what? With podcasting, you're not streaming that video or that audio. You're actually delivering a complete file to the person's computer. They have the file here. They can watch or listen to that file anywhere because they have it. I describe podcasting as what you want, where you want it, when you want it because that is exactly what it is. It comes to the computer, you can walk away with your computer and not have any Wi-Fi or anything and still watch that video or listen to that audio. And if you have one of these little devils or something similar, we always say podcasting does not require an iPod, it just works really well with it. I can be standing in the middle of the plaza down there with no internet connection at all and watch a video or listen to the audio. I can be riding my bike, I can be out on my boat, I can be anywhere and still have that content with me. When I drove up here from LA on Sunday, it's a five and a half hour drive, guess what I listened to in the car the whole way here? Podcast. I have some audiobooks as well, I think I threw one of those in every so often, I threw in some old time radio, but I listened to my iPod the whole way here. I don't listen to radio much anymore, whether terrestrial or satellite. It doesn't interest me because theoretically with podcasting, everything that's on here is potentially something I want to listen to. 
because I have subscribed to podcasts which meet my interests, right? I don't have to listen through Wham! (laughs) to get to the Who. I have my personal radio and television station right here in the palm of my hand or on my computer as well. Because I want to just reinforce, because you're delivering that actual media file to someone, that gives the ability to take it with them. And personally, I think that is what's so important about podcasting. You are giving them the freedom to do with it as they wish. How many people have a TiVo or, or other DVR? You know already the power of time shifting. Well, add to the power of time shifting, place shifting. You can be up at the top of uh, Mount Whitney, <laughs> you know, watching a story about other people who climb Mount Whitney or something like that. And you can take it to ludicrous extremes. So we have video sharing, we have podcasting. Any questions about podcasting? Third pillar. Again, sounds similar, but yet isn't. Video, live video streaming. How many people have ever used Ustream or Stick'em or Yahoo Live or anything like that to, to send out a live video broadcast to any of your people? Nobody. Okay. Do it. Okay. Now, live events suffer from a little bit. You have time zone issues. You have location issues, you have to be connected to the network and such, but imagine being able to, say your company is scattered all over the United States, imagine to be able to have your employees, you know, I hate to bring it up in this kind of bad economic times, but if you've had a major layoff in your company, you need to talk to your employees that are left, okay? Imagine being able to either in the office or at home, sit down and have a live interactive video talk, question and answer session with your CEO. You can do that for free. Favorite word again. Ustream allows you, using a built-in webcam, a camcorder plugged into your computer being used as a webcam, an external webcam, to basically stream live, stream video and audio live from wherever you have an internet connection. Including, doesn't work quite as well, but if you have an Evdo card, the cellular data network like this thing uses, the 3G network, you can even do it from the middle of a field if you want. Because as long as you have a data connection, you can do it. In some ways, the quality can be quite good. If you have a nice, good internet connection, the audio and video quality can be outstanding. I have a friend who has a band, and this is something I tell all musical groups. You want to increase your profile, you want to get more people to your shows, you want to interact with your fans more, start streaming every single one of your performances. We streamed one of her shows. We had listeners who loved her music. Obviously, they were in Europe. They could obviously not come to Southern California to see the show. They watched live from their own home, chatting in the associated chat room that's there, requesting songs, virtually applauding at the end of songs, and she could interact with them via this chat room. Uh, we had a person writing her, you know, running the chat room, and she would say, oh, Mary from, uh, you know, Provence says, I want to hear this song, and Andre could be on stage and actually talk back to them, okay? You can take that even a step further in that Ustream has the ability to bring in a co-host in a little window, and you can actually have a two-way conversation with that co-host that everyone else can watch. If you go to a site like Stick'em, and it's S-T-I-K, ah, sorry, S T I. CKAM.com. I have it at, uh, at the end of the presentation. Um, you can actually have six people in a room and unlimited viewers. So you can conceivably have a panel discussion going on with people in six different locations. Actually, it's six people plus the host, so it's up to seven people. Okay? And hundreds of people watching. Uh, is anyone familiar with Leo Laporte? He was on Tech TV. He's kind of a tech geek media god, if you will. He does Stick'em, he does Ustream, he has thousands of viewers coming in during his shows, watching his shows, okay? Other benefit to live streaming, we talked about the problem with the the time zones and stuff. Well, guess what? You can actually record your live show. It actually records to Ustream. People can, can come in and watch it when they can. They can actually also embed that video in a website. And uh, it's not quite working well yet. They're one of the first ones to actually provide a conversion from the Flash format that all these video sites use back to MPEG-4. 
and you can podcast it. You can bring it back down to all the people who are subscribed to your media streams, your feeds, and they can actually get it down here. I have some audio sync problems. It's the biggest problem I have with it. If you're just listening, it's actually not that bad because you don't notice it. The, the, it's like a bad ninja movie. Um, <laughs> but they are, they are, they're working on that day after day after day. And it's my goal to get more and more companies doing that. If they're capturing FLV files to allow me to convert them to MP4 so I can podcast them. Other way around that, though, simply run a, simply run a tape on your, on your person while you're streaming live. Then you have it. Then you have the raw footage. You can do whatever you wish, you, you wish with it. And it'll be high quality. And then you can podcast that version. And I do fall back on that sometimes. I want to podcast. I want to deliver my media to people who have already said, I want to receive your stuff. So I take a little more effort, and I capture it myself. I just do it in both areas. That makes sense to everybody? You going to try this? Just try it with a friend, really. It's fun. It really is fun. And finally, the one ring to bind them all. And in the well, one ring to find them all. And in the darkness, bind them. Social media. This is truly the one ring. I, I, if you're not involved in social media in big ways, you will be. <laughs> because this is by far, of the, uh, of the four things I've mentioned, this is by far the one that's bifurcating and cloning itself as we speak. Uh, this is breaking off into all these different little tentacles that are just kind of acting like the ring and binding all this stuff together. How many people have a Facebook account? How many people have a MySpace account? I, I agree. I, MySpace is ugly. <laughs> How many people have a Twitter account? Yeah. Why, don't I, why, don't, why aren't I following you? <laughs> Make sure I follow you. Uh, how many people have a... How many have used ing, N-I-N-G dot com, to set up their own social network? Well, you're, but you know what it is, right? By the way, N-I-N-G dot com, set up your own Facebook. Four, what's my favorite word? Free, exactly. Social media is going to continue doing it. It's going to continue breaking off into these little, you know, Twitter is different from Facebook, which is different from MySpace, which is different from Ing, which is different from uh, microblogging, which is different from all these things. And it, it is truly just kind of creeping through. But the fact is, it is what binds everything together because it provides you additional locations to present your message. I liken to setting up on Facebook, sending an account up on Facebook to, I grew up in a small town in Ohio, 2,000 people. I liken it to going, moving to the county seat and setting up a storefront on Main Street in the county seat. Hey, I'm in your town. I like you people. I want you to be my customer. So I'm going to come here and set up a storefront on your Main Street. That's what you're doing with MySpace and Facebook and all these other social media sites. You are going where people live. Because the fact is, people live and die in their own little worlds. Some of us are Facebook people. Some of us are MySpace people. Some of us are Twitter people. Some of us, like myself, are everywhere. Uh, <laughs> but you don't have to be. The fact is, by engaging people in those areas, you're actually expanding your audience. I had a, an epiphany when I first started podcasting. I had been writing my print column, Career Opportunities, for about eight years. It appeared in a magazine in San Diego. I toyed with doing audio versions of those, but realized, yeah, but how many people are really going to come to the website and click on the link to listen to them? You know, and I was like, eh. Podcasting came along. I had the distribution method. Even then, I thought, OK. The audio files are just a way for my already existing readers to simply consume those columns in a different format. I very quickly found out there is no such thing. There are readers, and there are listeners, and there is almost no overlap between. So basically, by providing another media type, I just expanded my audience by two, three, four times. Because now I was talking to a whole different audience who could and would consume the columns it w in my voice, but they would probably never search them out on a blog to read them. Never, never expected that in a million years. I, I really just, it, it was a blow. I, I, was, I couldn't believe it. Because I started asking people, well, how do you get it? Well, I listen to it. Well, I read it. Well, do you do? No, I just do that thing. Social media is the same way. You're reaching out to the Facebook people. You're going to meet people you've never reached before. You go to MySpace, you're going to reach people you've never reached before. It is amazing. Even with all the social media, though, you still have, have a place for your stuff, as George Carlin said. Okay? If you're reaching out 
to these four pillars. If you're putting stuff on YouTube, if you're, putting, if you're doing things on Ustream, if you're podcasting, the most important thing you can put in any of, that, any of those pieces of media is the URL for your home base. Mine is welchright.com. You visit that page, there's nothing on there except my latest video and five links to my blogs and podcasts and a couple other things, but that's, that's, that's what's above the fold. That is my home base. Every video ends with that URL. Every audio ends either with that URL or if I'm doing something for a new media interchange to the new media interchange site. The fact is your media files, because of all this stuff, can get disassociated from your website and disassociated from you. So you always have to refer people back to the place where your stuff lives. That doesn't mean that people will always be going there. What it does mean if someone stumbles across you, which is another reason we do all of this stuff, is to give people an opportunity to stumble across your media, you got to get them back to your site. Because your goal is to capture them. Your goal is to friend them on Facebook. Your goal is to get them to subscribe to your podcast. Your goal is to get them to sign up to your email newsletter. Your goal is to have them give their permission to you to come into their ears and eyes whenever you have something to say. Now, as you might imagine, though, have something interesting to say when you do that because they can revoke that permission with a click, okay? The fact is, people are willing to give their permission for you to come into their homes and into their computers and into their iPods if they like what you're having to say. And in fact, you don't really know who your audience is until you put something out there. Just like I didn't know with my podcast that I would have listeners and readers, you can't actually know who your audience is until you put it out there. I have people tell me all the time, well, what do I have to podcast about? And it's like my friend Carrie, she's an amateur natural. She's actually getting her degree in ecological studies right now. And I said, Carrie, you know every lizard that lives in the San Fernando Valley, where its habitat lies, what its food source is, how it reproduces. What do you mean you have nothing to say in a podcast? And her response is, well, who wants to hear about that? Other herpetology geeks like you. <laughs> there are over 25 knitting podcasts in the iTunes podcast directory, OK? Knitting. There was oh, some, I saw a Twitter earlier. <laughs> who was knitting? Who was knitting? Was it in here? There was someone knitting in the, in the, uh, in the um, uh, keynote this morning. I see, people, I see people doing that all the time, actually, in, in conferences and stuff. It's, it's something new. I Twitter, they knit, OK? Who would have ever, OK, I can guarantee you, there would never be a weekly knitting show on television nationally. Now, there might be locally, because I know in, uh, in Ohio, at Bowling Green, we had a quilting show. But PBS, you know, once, once a week, once a month, not. This, these, there are 25 of these shows out there, and they all garner an audience because there are always other people interested in what you're interested in. There's always people interested in what you have to say, no matter how esoteric it gets. There are nanotechnology podcasts. There are weapons industry podcasts. There, there can be a podcast about anything, and the fact is you have something important to say. You have a message to get out. You have something you want to communicate with the world, there are other people out there who want to listen to it. We're not conditioned for that. We're, we're conditioned after, over the last 100 years of saying, well, if it's not on network TV, it doesn't mean anything. To which I say, there's stuff on network TV now that there are podcasts that are much better than what's on network TV right now. In fact, I would like to see some of the podcasts get broadcast because then they would get out to more people. But the fact is, it's not about more people. It's about connecting with the people who are interested. Okay. I do a gardening podcast. There are probably 50 more of them out there, probably more than that. I'm probably underestimating that by a hundredfold. Uh, I do a technology podcast. A bunch of technology podcasts out there. People listen to mine because I have, it's, it's about what I have to say about the technology. It's not just parroting what everyone else is, not, not just press releases and oh, a new product came out. It's about me dealing with my day-to-day -day consulting clients and what I ran into and odd things that I ran into. I also do a class at my local library twice a month. I stream the class live. I then podcast the audio from the class every two weeks at the end of it. So if people weren't able to tune in live, they can listen to it. I had actually thought about not doing that. And I mentioned that during one of the classes. And I got three notes that said, what do you mean? I listen to those every, every time they're on. It's like, OK, you know, I, I don't know my audience. 
You don't either. There are so many new things out there that I know, because I hear this from people, they get overwhelmed. God, I've got to try Twitter, I've got to do Facebook, I've got to do MySpace. Which one should I try, and do I have to do them all? And I had the same thoughts just a couple weeks ago. I was like, God, this, you know, this is getting really hectic. There's just so many new things every single day, and so many new services, and so many new sites, and so many new podcasts. Like, you know, it's really worth... And then I signed up for some new service, and I don't remember which one it was. And they all have services now where you can say, Who's already at my, who, who do I already know that's on this site already? And you get the people that you know who are, who are like you, uber geeks and on every site on the planet. You find them. But it never fails. I always find five, six, seven, ten, twenty people on a new service that have never heard of me before. Okay, I am, for Doug Welch and Douglas Welch, I am the number one and number two hits in Google. And there are still people who don't know about me, Okay. <laughs> And that's a weird thing that I don't know how it happened. I think I just buried them in content because I don't do any sort of Google uh, optimization or anything. You will always meet new people who have never heard of you before. You go to that county seat, you're going to meet people you've never met before. That alone makes at least trying out these services worthwhile. After that fact, you're going to have to say, does this fit into my work, workflow or not? When I started on Twitter, I had no idea. I was kind of like, eh, it's sort of odd. I don't, you know, I'm, an, I, I'm a big IM person and a big you know, instant messenger and all that stuff. But I didn't know what Twitter was, and so I couldn't really make a decision of, of how it was going to work in my life. Now, God, I just got the iPhone like three months ago, two, two and three months ago. Now, I was already a Twitter addict. Now, I, what's above an addict? I, I was, you know, <laughs> obsessive. I don't know. Now I'm like, Arr. here, it, it makes conferences so amazing. Because literally, we've been all... I've been here since Sunday night. We did the Adobe thing yesterday, and I've done this. The whole time, we have little markers we can put in our messages, you know, DevLearn. And then you can follow other people who are putting DevLearn in. And you can see, basically, what's going on in the whole conference. Oh, I'm in session number 202. Oh, and it's good, or it's bad, or it's indifferent, or whatever. Oh, uh, something, oh, and you know, they'll, they'll, they'll uh, Twitter out quotes from the session. Whispering in their ears. Twitter that. <laughs> they'll Twitter out quotes from the session. And I can't possibly be in every session at this conference. But in some little way, I, I, can, I can get a feeling for what's going on. Last night for dinner, we got, uh, we got done about 4.30, I guess. I went back to him. I was falling asleep in the room, but I was watching the Twitter stream. And it's like, okay, we're starting to gather in, in the lobby for, to figure out where to go for dinner. And it's like, oh, okay, better get up now, because otherwise I'll fall asleep. Went downstairs. There was a horde of like 30 people downstairs all meeting up for dinner. And about 16 of us went over to Il for now, just s- seriously through nothing but reconnecting. You know, some people we knew, some we didn't, but just reconnecting on Twitter, we were able to self-organize and say, let's go to dinner. I, the, the conference use of Twitter is what really sold it for me. I also use it to basically give people information about me that they might not otherwise know. If you follow me on Twitter, you'll very quickly realize that I am a coffee lover. Almost to the extent of every... I, I say a geek in one thing, a geek in all things. But if you didn't know me in person, you may not, you know, I never know Doug was interested in coffee, geez, or wine, or anything else that I geek out on. <laughs> you can very casually discover out information about people, even if they're virtual friends, that you might not otherwise have known. Because we can always kind of get trapped in our own, I'm, I'm an e-learning professional. This is what I do, and I'm in my little box. And the fact is, you go hiking Mount Whitney, I'm using that example, you know, you hiked Mount Whitney last month. There are people who are going to be like, oh, wow, that's cool, you know, I like hiking too. You're, you're going to share this information. It, it rounds you out as a person. And frankly, the biggest benefit for Twitter for me, I've actually billed out. I've, I've actually got billable hours from Twitter. I have answered a question from people and had them say, oh, you know how to fix this? Come out and fix up my computer. Okay. I'm sold. <laughs> I'm sold totally on that. Yes, you had a question. No, and if you do that to me, I will unfollow you quickly. No. <laughs> yeah. You, you do a lot of, I've had people follow me, and I, and I, I wonder if it's almost like... Yes. There are some people who cannot turn off the, 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 the business gene, who is like, ooh, if I randomly follow them, they will see my URL, and therefore I, I will get one opportunity to sell them. And in fact, what they're doing is they're turning off that person forever, unfortunately. Um, you could use it for that. I, the, I, have a whole, I have a whole deck on Twitter, and we can talk later. Uh, there's unsystematic uses of Twitter and systematic. It is some combination of the two that I think yields the best amount. I'm not telling you how to use Twitter, but I think it is a combination of those two. Yeah. 
Yes? And your head's ready to explode. <laughs> I understand. I understand. It's just getting started now. Yeah, you're you're just seeing the software now to do that. Uh, look, is it Laconia? Laconia is the open source software. I think that's the right name. Is the open source software that basically Twitter is kind of based on, and it allows you to set up your own server inside your intranet, closed off to the world, that could take your 20 call centers or whatever they are and allow them to do that. Now, I'll say there might even be a better, there, uh, with a combination, there might even be a better choice for you, and that is an internal wiki. Has everyone, is, are you familiar with wikis? I say rather than, rather than lock it down with corporate rules, um, the fact is like in a wiki, you see who made the change. Well, well, you, well the fact is in a wiki, you see who made the change. When someone puts inaccurate information in there, there is a certain amount of farming that has to be done with your wiki, but it's, but it's, but it's very easy to say, no, you're wrong, and, and correct that person, even offline. I wouldn't probably do it in front of everybody, but just revert the information and say, no, no, this is our policy on this. I think... And, I, and I'm, I must admit, I'm not, I'm not really a corporate. I, I worked in the corporate world, but I'm not really a fan of the corporate world. But I understand the needs of it. What I like to do, yeah, what I like to do is use, how do I, how do I say that? Use self, self-policing as much as you can. As much as you can, I think your results will be better. But yeah, you could take Twitter, and you can, you can combine this internal Twitter with an internal wiki and you will be surprised, you will be amazed at the information that comes out. Because suddenly all these 20 centers that never were able to communicate amongst themselves effectively, now are like, you've got this one huge clunk of data that's like, what do you mean? I, I didn't hear about that. How did you find that out? Well, and, and you, if you can facilitate that communication, boy, you're on the right track, yeah, definitely. I mean, I wouldn't want to push that. I just wouldn't want to it. It's, 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 it's a tightrope you have to walk. And, you just, and honestly, you just have to do it. There was a question. I'll let you find it out amongst yourself. First, the one woman in front. Oh, okay. Um, I work with a company that makes TurboTax and Quicken. Into it. Into it. And um, one of the things that we recently did in the business division is we're getting that it's been fascinating to watch the evolution of it is um, the TurboTax live feed. And so there was this real desire to kind of reduce our dependence on um, seasonal hires to staff our call centers and get a tremendous amount of training now. You know, getting people up on the product and all that sort of thing. And so the concept became, well, could we just post it out on the internet and have users answer everybody's questions on their own? And to your point, mm-hmm. there, there was, you know, if we were starving, obviously, we were financial services, and we got, how would we do that legally, you know? And uh, it's been amazing to watch because not only have we absolutely reduced the number of hires that we had to do seasonally, but the users actually are more accurate in our responses than our <laughs> And, and, and you know why they're more accurate? They use it. They use it. 
and that is a perfect segue. Dixie, I'll get to your question in just a second because I want to move on to my next slide. That's a perfect question, a perfect segue because, up, oh, I'm going to go. The power of new media is in the doing. You can think about it till the cows come home, or, you know, what other unearthly expression? Can you tell I'm from Ohio? Uh, you can do it until the cows come home. You can think about it, but if you're not doing it, it does. It, I see people get paralyzed every single day. It's got to be perfect. I can't put it out there until it's perfect. And I always say, perfection is a goal. Perfection is the clouds in the sky. It's a, you want to shoot for that. You want it to be as nice looking and as nice sounding and as well put together as you possibly can up until the point that it stops you from doing it. Because the power is in the doing. And so my final message today is that. Okay? If, any, if I send you away with any message today, that's what I want to send you away with. Do it now. You will be amazed. Just like the people we've heard, you will be amazed at the results that you, you never will have expected if you just do it. Dixie, you had a question. You know, and, that, and, and, un, and unfortunately, and let me, let me put on my career opportunities hat here for a second. Uh, unfortunately, the only thing we're left with sometimes is to go somewhere else. Because if the institutional memory of the corporation or the company is such that there is, and oftentimes it's really frightening, and I write about this oftentimes, it can be one person blocking the whole thing. If you can't creatively figure a way around that person, you're stuck. Yeah. And we have lots of comments on that. So go ahead. Yes, sir. What we do is we don't tell anybody. Yeah, that. <laughs> ask, ask forgiveness, not permission, right? <laughs> yes! <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Oh, I'm sorry. There's another piece of it. As this opens up, this is shifting this paradigm dramatically. I'm the consultant in the company. I'm hitting that with all of my clients. And I have to tell them on a regular basis, the security of information is dead. Somebody comes in with a camera on their phone, it's dead. It's fast, it's gone. But it's tightening up like this because it's scary. It's going to go away. They're going to have to move up because the Gen Ys are coming in, the millennials are saying, if, I, if you cannot guarantee me social networking capability, I'm walking. We're seeing that in our yep. clients. They're leaving because there's not enough. I, I am not going to be able to network myself yep. within this organization because they're shutting this down. I am out of here. They're leaving. And so right now, the corporations are like, no, 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 you're not getting anything in here. Productivity, productivity, productivity. They're suffering. They're productivity suffering because they're clamping down. But they're going to open up because it's going to have to. I gave... I gave our security expert at Walt Disney Imagineering when I worked there back in the late 80s, early 90s, a, a fit one day. Because we were all, we can't email that, can't do that, can't, you know, this is, this is early in the internet, you can't email that. And it's like, oh, no, we can't, we can't put that out there because it might be, you know, emailed to someone. And I said, have you looked at the fax machine lately? <laughs> do, do you see a padlock on the fax machine? And worse still, we use thermal faxes. I grabbed a ribbon out of one of them and I go, what document would you like to see that's been faxed out of this office in the last week? It's exactly right. You, 
the point is to have your information and good information out there. You, you cannot withhold the information any longer because it's going to kill you. It, it, it's going to drive you mad, I would say. It, it's going to drive the, the, the corporation absolutely mad because they're going to get really, really paranoid until the point where they're just going to become very non-functional. <laughs> Because they want to organize out in the world, but they also want to organize internally, like we were just saying with your, with your senators. They want to talk internally. I knew that when I was on the help desk oh, I, years ago, <laughs> I, would have, I, I was on the help desk before there was wide use of the internet, when we were dealing with bulletin boards from vendors and stuff like that. Internal information sharing was required, and it usually took form of standing around the water cooler saying, did you run into that? What have you done if you run into that? I mean, seriously, we have so many tools available to us these days that we really need to make use of them. Yes, sir? Uh, I know there's plenty of anecdotal evidence, and I think we all agree to that. Does anyone know of any empirical evidence that says yeah. this, is, this is the productivity gain? Or... I find, I'm gonna, putting on my career hat, uh, I find that the problem that Dixie mentioned is what you start to run into. The quality and the quantity of employees that you are able to attract to your company, you can simply not attract the brain power. And if you need them, and retaining. Sounds like e-learning guilt. Sounds like, sounds like if someone wants to do their master's thesis, my wife's, my wife's writing her dis PhD dissertation right now, so there's a bit of unique research that could be done. Hmm? Um, I am actually sure, and, I, and I'm not an expert in it, so I will totally admit that. Uh, I would say, I bet if we search the internet, we could probably find some hard data on it, because I'm sure people have addressed it, consultants especially, because this is something they deal with every single day. How do I prove it to this company that this is worth doing? And you have to start showing them hard numbers. So I'm sure, I'm, perhaps even you could, could lead us to some data on that. Um, that's not my well, bailiwick. It's not becoming empirical yet is because it is embarrassing to these corporations. They aren't going to release that data. They're not going to do it. And what happens when they find themselves in that position, they scramble around and try to figure out how to fix it. And they put things together around it and start pulling people in. But I know at least in the industry I work in, oil and gas, you will never get numbers out of them. Not but you're a consultant, so the consultants need to write the research. I can give you know, Yep. I can give tons of anecdotal data, but I cannot give empirical statistical data yeah. because I, I can't even look back. And we have to remember, too, and this is something I always bring up because it's important, because uh, I deal with traditional media people in Los Angeles all the time. And their first question is, well, when are we going to start making money on this? The first question out of their mouth is usually, how do I monetize this? Yeah. And the fact is, I, the only thing I can say back to them, I'm sure television did not make money in its first five years. <laughs> We've only been around in this sort of environment for five years. We are still a toddler. It is still a toddler, I should say, kind of bumbling its way along. Definitely that is something that needs to be, have more attention spent to it. Uh, but I think we can see, even in the anecdotal evidence, I think we can see. I mean, Dixie's saying, you know, they're having trouble attracting. And people are actually saying back to you then, well, if I can't do this, I, I can't do my job. Which is. No, if I can't do this, I won't do, I won't, my, job. I won't do my job here, yes. I won't do it here. Okay. Right. Right. Yes, ma'am. Question. And that's always been a concern. I've always heard in the training world that, yeah, that that's all, you know, I, I'm going to train them and they're going to go somewhere else. So it's like, well, okay, then figure out why they're going somewhere else yeah. and fix it. Because it is, it is definitely a concern. Yes, sir? Uh, you don't, unfortunately. It's much like managing the change in a computer, you know, in the tech industry. Now, I will say... Predictable change. Uh, this is a uh, far more dynamic than hardware for doing 
goes back to what I said. You try every, as you, as someone who's, who's engaging it, you try everything. And I remember, I'm not saying you, you use everything, but you're the one out there picking through the minefield, if you will. You're the one checking everything out and going, okay, oh, that's something that gives me a tool that I actually can really use. And then you go, okay, guys, over here. You kind of you steer them around and, and direct people that way. Because it's only, it's, it's, at least right now, it's only in the doing. It's only in the actually trying these things out that you'll really discover what will work for you. There's a great application out there called Evernote. Does anyone use Evernote? It's a great application. I cannot fit it into my workflow at all. It's, it's, I'm, I, I don't know. It's just, it doesn't fit the way I work. But it's a great application. It, it allows you to store photos. And, you know, it's, a, it's a data collection tool. Take photos on the iPhone and actually do text to, uh, do OCR on the text and things so you can search on. I just cannot. And that, that's exactly the type of thing you run into. It just for me, it doesn't connect. And that's your goal. Is just to, and again, you don't spend a lot of time on this. And you may revisit things later. You know, right now you may not have use for it, but down the road you might. So you can't, at least you know about it now. And it's like, oh, oh, you know what? We now have a need for this type of thing. And I remember back, uh, you know, two months ago, three months ago, there was this thing that came out. Let's go check out it now and see if it works for this. And you'll just start to develop these um, collections of tools that you can use. And frankly, the way you then should do is you actually share that information as you collect it. You have it in a wiki. Hey, I got this new video streaming site that has a password protection, so we could actually use this free site to do closed trainings. You know, we don't have to set up our own video server. We can actually use Ustream, which has password protection, send out an email to everyone with the proper password, and only they can get in. You know, the little, little tidbits like that you find. Any other questions? Any other comments? Any other brick bats? Does anyone know what a brick bat is? I actually do, but. <laughs> I hope I've convinced you today that um, new media is useful in a number of ways. I know some of you are facing issues with how useful is this whole podcasting thing. I hope I've intrigued you enough to go out and do it, to go back to the slide. <laughs> um, go out there and try it. You will personally find it rewarding, if nothing else. Uh, I think your companies will also find it rewarding because the amount of information that is captured and transferred will go up dramatically. Just like you found with the, uh, the, the connecting the people up. People do want to communicate. And not just about, oh man, I was so drunk last night. They actually want to communicate. <laughs> they'll, yes, they want to communicate about that too, but they also want to communicate about their work. I like to believe that most people in most jobs want to do a good job. And if you can provide them the tools that allow them to do that job better, and this goes back to the retention comment earlier, if you can facilitate them doing the job better instead of preventing them from doing the job better, I, I really believe that you're on the right track with that. Thank you ever so much for coming. I hope you've enjoyed your time here at DevLearn. If you have any questions of me, I'll put my information slide back up. It's also over there. Uh, you can find me at my website, my email, my Twitter address, and my phone number. If you, I'm going to be driving from 5 to 11 this, after, this evening, so if you have any questions, call me in the car. Uh, <laughs> thanks again, everybody.